on the class problems, the applications of work from class, from the workbook. Um, these questions are intended to be a little bit more difficult, more challenging ways of looking at work and how we might treat problems that use work uh, in a little bit more, a uh, little bit harder of a context. So uh, we're just going to go through these. Uh, we'll go through these in class. This video is intended if you are either absent or you just want a second look at these all. So um, I'll just take my screenshots over and let's let's do these problems. Okay. So this first question, this first question. Uh, so make sure you have these pulled up in your workbook right now as well. Uh, so you can be going over these and writing everything down as we go through it. This first question, we've got a force versus distance graph of pulling back the bowstring of a bow and arrow. Um, this graph is shown below. Um, one thing I want you to notice on this straight away, right? And anytime you get a graph, what's the first thing you look at? Look at the axes. We've got force and we've got displacement or distance. But in, in this case, it's, it's going to be the same force. Uh, right, because in, in a bow, right, you start, you start, uh, let's draw our bow up here, that's, that's a terrible line. You start with your bow string, right, and there's the bow, and it's kind of all straight. But then, you get your bow, and your bow is kind of more bent, and the string is pulled back, right, you have the arrow, you have the arrow knocked, um, arrow's going that way. Okay, so, since this was our initial line here, Right, our distance is the same as displacement because it moves along the same line. Okay, so this is our initial. Um, we're going to use E naught and E final, right, because we're in the energy unit. So we're definitely using energy. The other way we can tell we're using energy is exactly what we looked at here, right? Force on the y-axis, distance or displacement on the x-axis. Because, right, if you have force and displacement... What happens when you do force times displacement? Well, work. All right, you get force times displacement. Um, okay, so this number one asks us how much work is needed to pull back the bowstring. All right, well, work, right, there's two ways to do work. Work is either our change in energy, um, or if we want to relate work to forces, we can do work as force times the distance times the cosine of the angle between these two things, between the force and the distance. Well, if we're pulling, pulling back our bow over here, right, the force that we're exerting on this bow is going to be straight back. But then what's the displacement that happens on the bow? Oh, the displacement, right, that's our force. And then our displacement is also straight back. So those two go right together. They are parallel so what happens to that cosine theta when those are parallel? Goes away to one. So this tells us, okay, right now that our work is force times displacement. Okay, so now when I'm looking at how much work is needed to pull back the bowstring, I have either option one, change in energy, or option two, force times displacement. Well, I'm given forces, right, on our y-axis. I'm given displacements on our x-axis. What do you think of these two we're going to use? Yep, option two. Okay, but here's the question. Right at this, at this displacement, we've used this much force. At this displacement, at point two, we've used this much force. At point three of displacement, we've used 200 newtons of force. So it changes. We can't just plug in a constant number for force or a constant number for displacement because we're pulling it further and further back, and we're using more and more force. Well... If you remember the exact same way we've treated everything else, when we're given a graph with force and displacement and I'm asked to multiply the two, always going to take the area. When asked to multiply two things that we're given a graph of, always take the area. So we've got this big triangle over here. Got this big triangle, right? This triangle um, so equals the area of a force displacement graph. <laughs> This triangle, right, what's the height of the area? It's base times height over 2. So 0.6 times height, 400, that over 2. Okay, let's plug this in. Turn my calculator on here. On, maybe. Maybe. Come on, turn on for me. On, 0.6. Ugh. 
hate when the calculator does this. Sorry, one moment. Let's get the calculator pulled up. Here we go. Perfect. Okay, 0. 0.6 times 400 over 2. 400 over 2. 120. Okay, so our area is 120. And this is work. Remember, work has the same units as energy, which makes it 120 joules. All right. So we've just done 120 joules of work. This means that, right, I, I could ask you here, how far back did we pull the bowstring? Because we went from zero energy, right? It's just sitting here at energy initial. We went from zero joules of energy, and now we just added 120 joules of energy in Right, because now it has that elastic potential energy. It's stretched back. So our elastic potential energy is 120 joules. Okay. So that's all in elastic potential energy now. Now I'm asking, how fast will the arrow be shot? Okay. Well, there's two ways we could think about this. One, we could go from all the way at the beginning, from this one right here. Or we could go from this middle step where we have it drawn back right there. Either way. If I want to go from all the way at the beginning, right, E naught plus work equals E final, write this plus work, are we adding work in or are we taking work out? We're pulling back the bow. We're giving it extra energy, so this is plus work. Great. Well, if we go all the way from the beginning, it starts with zero. And then we add what we just figured out, 120 joules of work equals and then e final e final i'm asking how fast how fast will it be shot well once we release that bow what does it do the arrow moves so that turns into kinetic energy so now we have 120 is equal to one half mv squared okay well we've got a hundred gram mass remember we don't like grams what do we like kilograms move it over three times so 120 equals 1 half, mass is 0.1 V squared. So we get 240 divided by 0.1, so 2400 equals V squared. All right, let's see if my calculator wants to behave nicer this time. 2400, but we need to square root that, right? We can do 2 to the 0.5 is the same as square root. 48.99, or to 3 sig figs, 49 velocity equals 49.0 meters per second. All right, so it's just a conservation of energy problem again. I, I mean, all of them are. All right, so that was all the way from the beginning. The other way we could do it is if we take this from, from the drawn back state, this one on the right here. Because right, drawn back, we gave it 120 joules of work but we've already given it that. So in this case, if we go, I'll use a different color. If we go E naught equals E final, or sorry, E naught plus work, E naught plus work equals E final, this one we have elastic potential energy. And then work, well, between pulling the bow back, or having it pulled back, sorry, between having it pulled back and just releasing it, are we doing any work to the system? Or not exerting any forces over any displacement, so no, we're not doing any work. There's no change in it, except for the things that are already part of the system. Then equals E final, which is that kinetic energy. All right, okay, so how much potential energy elastic did we have? Well, to go from zero to drawn back, we put in 120 joules of energy, which gave us our final kinetic energy. And you can see now that those two methods would be the same. Those two methods would be the same. You'd get the same answer. Velocity is 49 meters per second. All right. Well, there's our first question. Nice. There's our first question. All right. So conservation of energy, right? E naught plus work equals E final. The main point on this question is where do we start versus where do we finish? The other main point on this question is this graph, right? This graph, anytime you're given a force, displacement, 
graph, an FD graph. This tells you you're going to use conservation of energy and work. Okay, so I'll write that down here. Because right last, last time when we were doing momentum, right, we had a different kind of graph. In this one, we have force displacement graph. This means energy. This means we're going to solve it with energy and that the area equals work, right, FD cosine theta. Let's say that's, that's our line. But if you remember from momentum, right, momentum, it wasn't an FD graph. It was an FT graph. Was, that was momentum. So we're going to use conservation of momentum there, momentum and impulse, right? Impulse, our area, area is equal to, our area is equal to, right, force times time, which is, the change in momentum. All right, that's mv final minus mv initial. All right, that, that's momentum. That's the area of these two graphs. All right, anytime you see a force displacement graph, work. Anytime you see a force time graph, momentum and impulse. All right. Let's move on to our next one then. Move on to our next problem. Okay. A 200, sorry, not 200, just a 70 kilogram. I'll get, I'll get the question number in here. A 70 kilogram cyclist is on top of an eight meter tall hill. That sits at an angle of 37 degrees above the horizontal. He reaches the bottom of the hill at a speed of 18.2 meters per second. With how much force did the cyclist pedal down the hill? Okay, so we've got a hill. All right, here's our little cyclist guy. We obviously not the best artist, but we've been over this. Okay, there's our dude sitting, pedaling, arms on the handlebars. All right, give us a little helmet. Got to have the helmet. Protect your noggin on everything we do. Protect your noggin. All right, there's our little cyclist. Our little cyclist right there. Okay. 70 kilogram cyclist, okay, so mass equals 70 kilograms, on top of an 8 meter tall hill, an 8 meter tall hill, sits at an angle of 37 degrees above the horizontal, so 37 degrees above the horizontal, reaches the bottom, when he reaches the bottom, I'm not going to draw that again, but when he reaches the bottom, moving at a speed of 18.2 meters per second. That's V final. Okay. How much force did the cyclist pedal down the hill? Okay. How much force did he pedal down the hill? Oh, man, this is... Because we're in the energy unit, you probably know how to how to solve this, right? We're going to start with energy. But if we weren't in the energy unit, how would you know what to do? Well, we have velocities. If we have a velocity, if we have a height, and we have force. If we have velocity, we have a height, we have a force. Not a forward, a force. Those all put together mean energy, right? Anything with velocities and heights, we're pretty much going to use energy, just regardless. Anything with velocities and heights. So that means we can do E naught plus work equals E final. All right, there's our conservation of energy. Okay. Well, uh, what is what is our, our, our energy initial? What kind of energy does our cyclist have up here? Well, the cyclist is on top of an 8-meter tall hill. I should probably say at rest. Is at rest. Okay, at rest, that rules out kinetic energy. Well, there's no springs involved, so this means he's just got gravitational potential energy. And then plus whatever work this guy does is equal to E final. Well, when he's down here at the bottom of this hill, there's no more gravitational potential energy. There's still no springs, so what's the only one left? Now there's kinetic energy. Okay, so you've got MGH plus, and then work, right, FD cosine theta. 
So I'm asking about forces, so we know we need to throw force in there somehow. There's our F. Is equal to our kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. Okay, can we cancel mass out? There's mass on the left, there's mass on the right, but there's no mass in that middle term, so we cannot cancel out mass. Cannot cancel out mass. All right. Okay, so this cosine theta, this is the tricky part. This is the really tricky part of this question. Because, right, I ask you about cosine theta, and then I give you that there's an angle of 37 degrees, but wait. Because what direction is this guy exerting the force? Well, forward, right? Down the hill. So our force is that way. But then which direction is the displacement of our little biker? It's down the hill. Those two arrows are parallel with each other. So what does that mean this theta is? Those angle or those arrows are parallel. Theta is zero. It is not. It is not the angle of the hill. This is not the angle of the hill. That cosine of theta is the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector. That's why those are both in that term. That's what theta is there. Okay, so now we've established that that's zero. Now we've got to plug all this stuff in. Okay, so now we've got mgh. All right, so mass m, 70, g, 10, h, 8 meter tall hill, plus f. Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. That's our pedaling force. Displacement, oh, we don't know displacement quite yet, do we? So that's going to be from here all the way to the bottom of the hill. Well, we know an angle and we know a height. We know one leg and we know one angle. So how can we get that? Uh, any of the rest of the angle? That's 8. It's 37 degrees. Well, we could say this is opposite and that's hypotenuse. So that tells us that sine of 37 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Um, all right, that's our distance that we've traveled. The other way you can do this is recognize, right, sine of 37. Oh, but what's 37 special for? That's special for our three, four, five triangles, right? Opposite of 37, this is our three. Opposite of the other angle, the bigger angle is our four. Opposite of this one is five triangles. So if eight is scaled by three, if 8 is scaled by 3, what is displacement scaled by? 8 scaled by 3, so displacement must be scaled by something. Well, if we take 8 over 3, 8 over 3, that'll tell us the scale. And now we need that many times bigger than 5, so times 5. That gives us our displacement, 13.333 which, if you did it this way, is going to spit out the exact same number. But our displacement, 13.3 meters. Okay, so force times displacement times 13.3 meters. Okay, equals 1 half mv squared. And he reaches the bottom at 18.2 gets squared. Okay. Let's do this then. So let's take the calculator over here. We've got 70 times, not plus, times 10 times 8. Okay, so we get 5,600. 5,600 plus 13.3 times whatever our force is is equal to 1 half times 70 times 18.2 squared, 11593.4. That rounds 11600. Okay, so then 13.3 times our force. I will subtract 5600 from both sides. Subtract 5600 from both sides. So that means our force is equal to 6,000. And then divide by 13.3 for 6,000 
divided by 13.3, 451, 451, and that is, it's a force, so it's in newtons. Okay. There's problem two. There's problem two. Okay, so this is just like every other problem that we've done, right? We started with E naught plus work goes to E final. That's always going to be the starting point, especially when we're given velocities, heights, and forces and all that stuff. That means energy. So we plug in, find that there's potential energy of gravity up top, kinetic energy at the bottom. Work is done. Here's the piece of this problem. Right, Every problem I give you in the class problems has something different that I want you to pay attention to. This is this one. That is the FD cosine theta, but that theta is zero. Or I'm sorry, the theta... Yeah, the theta is zero degrees, which means it goes away not to zero, but it goes away to one. Because that's the angle between the force and the displacement. You just plug everything in, use some triangle math to find displacement. There you go, 451 newtons. Okay. Number three. Number three. All right. So number three, we get some, some random John person. John pushes a crate across a floor with different surfaces. So we have to push with different forces. All right, crate on the floor pushes with 20 newtons for five meters. Uh, then, so five meters, 20 newtons. Then he has to do 35 newtons for 12 meters. 12 meters, 35 newtons. Not lowercase, not lowercase, uppercase. Then 10 newtons for the last 8 meters. How much work does John do? Oh, what's really nice is work is just additive. So work, if we want to take the work of section 1, all right, that's Fd cosine theta. If we want to take the work of section 2, that's another F d cosine theta. If we want to take the work of section 3, you guessed it, f d cosine theta. Okay, but the work of section 1, right, if he's pushing this way and the box is moving this way, right, that's our force vector, that's our displacement vector. What's theta? Theta 0 means that goes away to 1. Same thing here, because force is that way, displacement is that way, right? Force and displacement, they're in the same direction. So cosine of theta just goes away. So work of section 1, that's going to be 20 newtons times 5 meters that it was. So there's 100 joules. Work of section 2, all right, that's the 35 newtons times the 12 meters that it was going over. 35 times 12, that's 397. I believe I'm doing my mental math right. 35 times 12, oh, I missed, 420. 35 times 12, 420, my apologies, 420 joules. And then this last one, force is 10 newtons, displacement is 8 meters. Oh, I almost forgot my newtons up there. So that gives us 80 joules. Okay, so if I want work total, right, I'm just going to add the work from each one of these segments up all together. So I get 100 plus 420 plus 80. That tells me this is 600 joules of, and we call this the net work. We call that net work. All right, there you go. Pretty straightforward problem. All right, number four. Five and six. Okay, I'm gonna do number five first, actually. Number five, definitely an easier problem than all these. Number five is an easier problem, and we'll see why. Okay, so number five, you lift a 3.6 kilogram box up by 1.2 meters. How much work do you do? Okay, well, 3.6 kilograms. All right, 3.6 kilogram box. We are lifting it up 1.2 meters. Okay, so this is the part of physics where 
I know, I'm going to make you use your brains. When we lift it up by 1.2 meters, what's the problem with lifting things up? Is what's opposing us? Gravity, force of gravity is opposing us. So we're going to have to exert some force of lifting, whatever that is, to overcome force of gravity by 1.2 meters. Okay. Well, there's two ways, two ways to do this. One, we could look at energy initial plus work equals energy final. All right, energy initial, there's no energy. We do some amount of work, and then we end with gravitational potential energy because, right, we just lift it up higher. So work is MGH is 3.6 times 10 times 1.2. All right, and that, that gives us a pretty, pretty straightforward answer. Uh, 3.6 times 10 times 1.2. 43.2, it's work, so joules. All right. The other way we can think about this, let me just move this all over. The other way we can think about this is if we take, right, if we want to take work as F, D, cosine theta. Well, our force, right, force is up. Displacement, or moving it up, so what's the angle between up and up? Angle zero, cosine of theta one, goes away. So work is force times displacement. Well, what force are we having to lift with to overcome? Mg, right? Force of gravity. And then displacement, how far are we moving it up? Uh, 1.2 meters, that's our, that's our height. Oh, well, work equals mgh. And now you can see, going back and forth between these two, they're the exact same. So either way is fine to think about it, but this becomes a pretty straightforward problem. This actually, that's where potential energy of gravity being mgh, that's where it comes from. It's the force, mg, times the displacement, h. That's where it comes from. All right, there's number five. Okay, so we've got four and six left. Four is, four is a pretty hard problem. Um, it, it doesn't start very difficult, does number four, but it, it gets harder for sure. Number four, we've got a box sliding down a ramp. All right, so I told you, I warned you that we were going to mix work with inclined planes, and here we go. Box slides down an inclined plane that is at an angle of 30 degrees above the horizontal. Slides down 6.2 meters of the ramp, begins its descent, initial velocity, and then reaches the bottom of that. So, oh, I'm on the wrong tool. Okay, so 30 degrees above the horizontal, 30 degrees, 3 kilogram box. Uh, the box slides down 6.2 meters of the ramp. So whatever, I don't say it gets to the bottom, but it slides down 6.2 meters. And just, just so we're thinking about it, we are going to pay attention to when the block is at the bottom versus when the block is at the top, right? Because that's our height that we've gone, right? That's our 6.2 meters. That's our displacement. That's what the block has moved. It's going to be the same angle of 30 degrees. Okay, begins its descent. Initial velocity, V0 equals 5.8. And then it ends, V final equals 7.6. What is the coefficient of kinetic friction? So we need mu equals question mark. Okay, well, where do we know mu from? Well, mu, we know mu from frictional force is mu Fn. Frictional force is mu Fn. Oh, this tells us we're probably going to need a force. Okay, I've also told you, though, anytime we relate heights, right, things at different heights, if I give you velocities and a distance and forces... What are we going to use? Energy, E0 plus work equals E final. Oh, but here's the question. I've been, I've been bad about asking this on the last few problems. I'm sorry. E0 plus work equals E final. Are we putting work in? Are we putting energy in or are we taking energy out? Well, in this case, friction is slowing the block down. If we're slowing it down. We're not putting work in. We're taking it out. So that is minus work. Okay, so then we start, 
right? We start with potential energy of gravity and its moving kinetic energy. All right, I give you an initial velocity. Oh, I did a terrible job writing my units. Meters per second, there we go. And then minus work our F D cosine theta. And then energy final, well, it's moving, kinetic energy final. This is initial. Is it above the ground? Well, maybe. But why don't we just call this height, right? whatever it ends at, let's call that height of zero. So then we just take whatever this is, and that's going to be our H for our MGH. So we're going to say this has no potential energy of gravity. All right, so this will be MGH plus one half MV squared minus, okay, here's the other thing again, this is the cosine theta, well, which way is force of friction? Force of friction is up the hill. Force of friction displacement is down the hill. Those are kind of parallel to each other. So what does theta do? Theta goes away. So this is just F D. And this is friction and it's displacement. Okay, then equals one half M V final squared. Well, mass is not in every term. We don't have it here. However... Right, force of friction is mu Fn. So we're going to be looking, how can we plug this in for force of friction? Remember, on an inclined plane, normal force, on an inclined plane, normal force is Fgy, right? There's our box. All right, normal force, gravity, Fg, friction, force of friction, but we break gravity down into FGY and FGX. FGX. Remember, inclined planes are weird, and you can see why, because cosine of theta goes with Y. So we know FGY equals normal force, which equals MG cosine of the theta. By the way, this theta is the 30 degrees, right? Because that's because of the hill. So what we can do with this now is we can take this and plug it in to our overall equation, mv naught squared minus force of friction, right, is mu times the normal force times mg cosine theta times that displacement that it moves equals one half mv final squared. So I actually, I did not need to give you mass in this problem. I did, but I didn't need to. Okay, what this tells us, we're going to plug a bunch of things in now. So GH, all right, GH, I have to take this all G, 10, but then H we've got to get from our triangle here, right? We've got our triangle. Oh, here's a different color. We've got this triangle. Here I tell you it's 30 degrees, 30 degrees, there's H, distance is 6.2. So what this tells us, right, is... What this tells us, right, that's opposite of 30 degrees. Opposite of the 30 degrees, so sine of 30 is equal to h over 6.2. So that means our height, our height is going to be 6.2 times the sine of 30 degrees. Or, oh, am I in radians? I am in radians. How did I know I was in radians? Gave me a negative. All right, it gave me a negative. Sine of 30 degrees should not be a negative. There we go, 3.1. So H is going to be 3.1. H equals 3.1 meters. So 10 times 3.1. Okay, plus 1 half. Got rid of M. V naught. All right, V naught was 5.8 squared minus mu g is 10 cosine of theta well this is the 30 degrees right mu 10 cosine of 30 degrees because that's from the normal force that's from the normal force which came from over here that's from the normal force that came from the hill that's why that theta is 30 times our displacement, well, how far did the block move? The block moved 
Block moved 6.2 meters equals one half V final squared. V final, so times 7.6 squared. Okay, well, the only unknown we have there is this mu. I won't take the time to solve this right now because it's already getting a kind of long video. I won't take the time to solve for mu, but there it is. All right. I know there's part 4a and part 4b. Don't worry about those. Those are hard problems because this one, not only do you have to worry about kinetic energy turning into elastic potential energy, but you also have to worry about the change in gravitational potential energy as the spring compresses down a ramp. So don't worry. Don't worry about parts A and B of four. Uh, they're just harder than the AP test will ask. If you're curious about them, happy to work through them with you on your own. Okay. You push a 6.7 a seven, 6 .7 kilogram box along a guided track from an angle of 37 degrees away from the direction of the track. The track is 12 meters long, and the box has a coefficient of kinetic friction of 0.52. Starts from rest and reaches a final speed of 6.3 meters per second when you finish. Okay. Oh, it doesn't have a question that it asks. Uh, okay, it's supposed to be asking, with what force did you push? With what force did you push? What force did you push? All right. I'm going to solve this one kind of quickly because we're, we're running out of time. Um, or we're running out of time to make this anywhere worth your while for this video. So, right, energy initial plus work equals energy final. We know this because it's a, it is a, uh, energy problem in the energy unit but if i tell you kinetic friction right that kind of means forces the track is 12 meters long there's our displacement there's our velocity so forces displacement velocity that always means energy okay energy initial well it starts with none work well here's the thing about this problem this problem is teaching us that we are doing work of pushing but what else is happening? There is friction. Friction is slowing the block down, so that means minus work of friction. Okay. So we have two work terms going on. And then it's going to give us kinetic energy finally. It's on a horizontal track, right? Okay. So we're going to need the force of us pushing. Force of us pushing times the displacement that happened times the cosine of theta and right, that's between the displacement and the push minus the force of friction times the displacement friction acted upon times the cosine of the theta between the displacement and the friction equals one half mv final squared. Okay. Um, and as a reminder, fp equals question mark. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so we're looking for force of push. Well, how far did we push this along the track? 12 meters. What is the angle between the push and, and the displacement? I say from an angle of 37 degrees away from the direction of the track. So this is cosine of 37. Okay, minus then force of friction. Well, it's a horizontal track, so that's mu mg is force of friction times our displacement, well, that's still 12, cosine of theta. This is now the displacement between friction and displacement. Well, if we're pushing a box to the right, that means friction is acting this way, force of friction, but it's moving that way, displacement. So what's the angle between those? The angle's zero. Oh, sorry, the angle's zero, so cosine goes to one. So that cosine goes away. And one-half m, 6.7 v Final squared reaches 6.3 squared. Okay, so we get force of push times 12 cosine of 37 minus mu, I tell you 0.52 is that coefficient, m 6.7 g 10 displacement of 12 equals 1 half times 6.7 times that 6.3 squared. All right, then you can see that's the only variable right now is that force of push. 
I'll let you plug in numbers and solve for that force of push um, until you get a number there. But that's the setup, right? The, the important part on this one is multiple work terms. If you have multiple forces being applied, you have multiple terms of work. Then you have to ask yourself, each force, are we adding to the energy or are we taking away the energy? That's for each individual force. All right, with that, thanks for bearing with me through this video. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time in class.